my pleasure at this time to introduce to you Georgia Chikaris, who serves as the regional administrator for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's Region 6. That office is in Fort Worth, Texas, and it covers states of Louisiana, Mississippi, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, and the Indian Nation. We're very honored to have Georgia here with us to do our opening plenary address. Prior to coming to NHTSA in 1987, she was administrator of the Ohio Office of the Governor's Highway Safety Representatives. A native of Ohio, she received her graduate degree in education from Miami University. Georgia is a former teacher and university instructor. She's been a longtime highway safety advocate and has received recognition at both the state and national level for her years of work and her tireless efforts for highway safety. I'm honored to present to you Georgia Chicago. Thank you, Shirley. You're going to say good morning again? Good morning. See, it gets better each time. <laughs> well, never always like to say the commissioner warmed things up for me here. <laughs> but uh, I do want to thank Commissioner Santa Cruz and uh, uh, Shirley Thomas, uh, the governor's representative here in Mississippi, for inviting me to help kick off this wonderful event. I had the opportunity to be here last year. I was so impressed with the enthusiasm and, and excitement uh, from the participants and from the presenters. And I know that I'm speaking to the choir today because the wealth of information and knowledge and years of service and highway safety is much greater out here in the audience. So I'm here uh, to learn from all of you, too. One of the things in uh, looking at um, the future is the internet and all of the information that we can get at the touch of the finger. And so when I was invited to speak to the STARS Training and Recognition Sym Symposium, I thought, well, what does STARS mean? So I googled STARS and uh, it seemed very apropos the term that was selected for this this symposium because stars are cosmic energy engines that produce heat, light, and ultraviolet rays. They are fixed luminous points releasing energy that radiates far and wide into outer space. And some stars have always stood out from the rest, their brightness being a factor of how much energy they put out. And no one knows how many stars exist, but the number is staggering. Such an explanation for all the stars that are here, because to be stars in highway safety, the energy is important and it's palpable in this room. And I have to tell you, I had the opportunity to sit down and talk with the Mississippi Highway Safety Office for a little bit yesterday. and. Uh, talk about the passion and commitment that's necessary to get the job done. It was in that room. And if you don't mind, Ms. Shirley, I would like to recognize your staff and have them stand up here at the beginning of the conference rather than at the end and thank them for being stars in highway safety programs.
because of the many stars that are here today and all across Mississippi and the country, our streets and highways are safer and our quality of life is better. And if I could have uh, the slide up here, um, just to show what it's been like for highway safety. This gives one picture as a thousand words of where we started uh, back in 1966. We were losing over 50,000 people every single year. And the fatality rate was 5.5 lives per 100 ve uh, million vehicle miles traveled. Advocates were up in arms. I think some of you may have heard of the name Ralph Nader, and they were pushing to have something significant done in highway safety. In 1966, the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act and Highway Safety Act of 1966 changed the way our country approached traffic safety and vehicle safety. And as I told you, historically, um, it's really based on the advocates, but I think there was one other really important thing that happened in 1966 that uh, was the premise for passing the Motor Vehicle Safety Act of 1966. There was a young woman in Ohio who got her driver's license in July of 1966. Now, all of you are going to count up how old I am by me telling you that, but I scared the bejesus off of people. <laughs> and so they decided that we needed to really do something. But uh, it, it really was a significant event. And while there have been ups and downs in that process, you can see from that timeline and the fatality rate that involving the advocates involving everyone has really made a difference in highway safety. But while that little dot at the end for, and it's, that says 2010, and it's really gone down even further since that time, seems pretty low. We're still losing over 32,000 people every year. So our job isn't done. But I think it's important to go back and visit history uh, in some ways to see where we've come and really feel good about the fact that what we know, what we're doing is right. It really is making a difference. And back in 1966, uh, when the Motor Vehicle Act was adopted, there wasn't a National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the agency that uh, I work for didn't exist. But at that time, there was a recognition by Congress that there needed to be some national leadership in highway safety to bring together the focus solely on supporting traffic safety programs. But the act also recognized that the federal agency could not address the overwhelming challenge without state and local partners. So the Highway Safety Act of 1966 established the State Community Highway Safety Grant Program, commonly referred to as the 402 program. And any of you who get grant money have heard about the Section 402 program. But that act created a unique partnership among federal, state, and local governments, something you don't see in a lot of other areas. But and a recognition that happened many, many years ago. Since 1966, Congress has periodically reauthorized the highway safety program, reflecting the evolution of the program based on what we have learned over the years about what works and what doesn't work. And early on, you know, it was like the shotgun approach because there were so many problems out there. Now, there is an emphasis based on MAP 21, which is the latest reauthorization of the highway safety program that reflects the growth and knowledge of what we have found over the years. It emphasizes that we must work together. We must be comprehensive 
in our programs. We need to get smarter about the problem and more targeted in our approaches to highway safety. So MAP 21 requires data-driven performance measures linked to evidence-based strategies and projects. So you, if you are a grantee, you have to know that the Highway Safety Office here is really focused on looking at the data, drilling down, analyzing what it means, and looking for programs that are going to address those problems and drive the numbers down. The big difference now is the quality and availability of the traffic records data. In the 60s, drilling down the data to customize countermeasures was very difficult. It was a challenge. But data systems are now much more sophisticated and more timely, and they are improving all of the time because we use them. The more we use the data, the better the data will get. And the data is as good as the data that's collected and the data that's inputted. And many of you are on the ground floor and in part of that important effort. Sometimes a lot of what we do seems a little bureaucratic, data collection and reporting, but that brings to us more knowledge so that we can focus that program, those programs and target those efforts. Those of you in enforcement know that. When you know your community and you know where the pro problems are and you can target those efforts, you can make a bigger difference with a lot less money and a lot less time and effort. That's what this program is all about. But we have to have the data to, to, to really hone in on the programs and customize them so we can affect change. The past 10 years have really been good in this country for highway safety. We've made some substantial progress. However, as I mentioned before, 32,000 people every year that die on our highways is not acceptable. The annual 2013 national data will be released by the end of this year, but preliminary numbers indicate that we have recovered from the slight uptick that happened nationally 2012. That didn't happen here in Mississippi. You were able to continue to do that. But as we drive those numbers down, we're going to have little fluctuations. We have to be prepared to make the ad adjustments necessary to address them. We are going to need to fight hard to keep the numbers going down. And of course, we need to use the tried and true solutions. But we also need to get ahead of the game by identifying emergent issues and new game-changing technologies. A longtime friend of mine and a uh, highway safety advocate uh, was fond of saying that we have the level of the problem that we're willing to accept. And this has stuck with me over the years because it is so true. We have a wealth of evidence based on countermeasures available to us the things that work. The challenge is implementing, changing the status quo, changing the momentum, sometimes taking a chance, going a little bit far out on the limb. I bring this up because I want to use this opportunity to recognize the Mississippi leadership for really drawing the line in the sand to say increasing belt use is essential and the level of impaired driving problem is unacceptable and their actions and the results have shown that that makes a difference and they've been loud and clear the streets and highways of Mississippi are safer because of it however their job isn't done and they're going to continue to need your help they're going to need your support and collaboration they need the many partners to be willing to stand up and say they support their programs that can support endorsement for enforcement with outreach to the public. And I want to recognize Commissioner Santa Cruz, Colonel Barry, Captain McCain, and Governor's Highway Safety Representative Shirley Thomas. Mm -hmm. 
The annual symposium here supports this collaboration and spreads the knowledge about problems and the effective countermeasures to address them. So the conference theme, I'm told, is changing lanes for excellence, knowledge, and safety. The timing couldn't be better for such a conference because it's the time of the year in highway safety planning cycle that we again take stock of where we are and where we want to go. There are many programs that you're going to hear about in these next few days. I want to point out just a few that we see as very critical to continuing to move the numbers. Unrestrained fatalities and impaired driving still remain the country's top challenges. However, we do have a number of evidence-based countermeasures to implement, some of them that we're implement implementing across the board and some of them that we still need to push and make a difference on. Increasing nighttime belt use enforcement to increase belt use during the riskiest times and lowest belt use times is critical. The observation survey that we do across the country in each state are the high water marks. They're taken during the daytime after the major click it or ticket event to measure the impact of the click it or ticket event. And it has really made a difference over the years. But if you look at the data, we can tell that belt use at night is much lower. When the riskiest drivers are out on the road, when visibility is less. So we need to find and implement programs that are going to increase belt use, not only during the day, but at night. We need to be pushing programs on impaired driving. High visibility enforcement, we know, is one of the most effective programs that we have in the fight against drunk driving. And we continue to support that with national uh, media and air support. You get local air support from your highway safety program here in the state. But we also need to have other tools and efforts. We need to get the partners all out there speaking endorsement for enforcement, speaking for support of ignition interlocks for all offenders, expansion and use of sobriety checkpoints and no refusal programs to deter people from getting behind the wheel impaired to start with. We're not here out here just to catch people. We want them to make the right decision before they ever get behind the wheel. In addition to that, we know and have seen big changes in states that provide visible statewide leadership of the comprehensive impaired driving programs. A program such as Mississippi has been embarking on. But we also have some em emerging issues that I would like to mention. Uh, Secretary Fox, our uh, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Transportation, has identified pedestrian and bicycle safety as a priority issue for the department. Now, they don't have the greatest numbers as far as fatalities and injuries are concerned, but they're rising much ha faster than some of our other areas. Reflecting his background as a mayor and his experience as a father, the secretary is very aware of the toll crashes take on communities and on families. So he's sensitive to the tendency of bicycle and pedestrian crashes to affect the most vulnerable, vulnerable members of the population, including the elderly and youth, and the English as a second language populations. Under the Secretary's leadership, the Department has initiated a new multimodal pedestrian bicycle initiative involving NHTSA, the Federal Highway Administration, and the Federal Transit Administration. Information about this program we're hoping to share more with all of you over the next six months. As technology advances, so does the continued opportunity for distracted driving. It has been a priority for a number of years for the U.S. DOT and has been reaffirmed by Secretary Fox. Many states are looking very seriously at this continuing threat to the motoring public, and as a result, 41 states in Washington, D.C. now have texting bans. But 
we really need to be continuing to do this effort and looking at our young people in particular as we look at them taking advantage of technologies. We now have um, people who walk and text. We're in the ladies' room texting. They're eating dinner and texting. So the expectation that they aren't going to get behind the wheel and text, we would be turning a blind eye. We need to continue to get that information out. And I believe we have affected some knowledge differences, but sometimes enforcement is one of the bigger behavioral changes. And if your state doesn't have a specific texting ban, there are state laws that address distracted driving. So whatever can be done, we need to continue to get that message out. NHTSA has done some uh, surveys, attitude and awareness surveys, um, each year, and particularly with some young people. And one of the things that I really had found um, memorable is the question about how long do you think it's safe to keep your eyes off the roadway? You know, how long can you be looking and doing something else and still be able to control your car? From the younger age group, their answer was 10 seconds. So I'd like all of you to hold up your hands here like you're driving and help me count to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A little nervous? I would be. So we have some attitudes to continue to change out there in the area of distracted driving. But new technology is not all bad. And while we know that the biggest part of the, the problem in highway safety are driver-related behavior issues, there are things with changing vehicle and roadway design that we can do. And frankly, back when I was a young girl, any of you remember the Jetsons? Are they still on television? <laughs> I really thought by now we'd be flying around. And uh, that's why they needed to pass the law when I was 15, because speed was, in, w was the big thing. But with that, the technology is here, really, to help us control the vehicle and the highways to the point that we can really make significant differences. The issue is getting the public to accept some of those technology changes. But those of you who have had a new car lately know that we're starting to see little reminders in the car. We now have a light that will go on on uh, your side mirrors that will tell you someone's in your blind spot. Wonderful. You don't have to ch turn your head as long. Some of us who are getting older will be able to drive a little longer because there are going to be things that help speed up our uh, reaction. Uh, scanners in the front that will slow the car down. Now if you engage your cruise control and the car in front of you slows down, there are cars that will slow you down. There are now the ability to make your car known everywhere where you can talk to all of the other vehicles. It's going to take years for all of these cars to, be, to get into uh, the network of vehicles. But we are making some changes in that regard. And I think that one of these days, and maybe I won't be in highway safety any longer by that, we'll be able to have one of those uh, cars, and I don't know, can I say Google? since they're so well-known Google cars, uh, that'll drive themselves. And uh, I'll still be able to get to the hairdressers when I'm 90 years old. So 
there, there are some advances that are going to help us drive down the numbers and work that's being done on um, make, helping to identify that someone's had too much to drink when they get behind the, the wheel that would automatically be built into vehicles. The research is there. Um, they have to be about 100 percent effective and so that uh, slows things down a little but in the next 20 years there's going to be some amazing technological changes in the car but in the meantime there are things like ignition interlocks that are available now for offenders that technology that will help us and that will reduce those revolving doors that we now have uh, with impaired drivers that we need to do more to take advantage of. It's really an exciting time for highway safety by combining our investments in enforcement and education with the power of these new technologies, both vehicle and roadway. We can really help deliver the safer transportation future that all Americans really deserve. When you got your driver's license, it was a privilege. It wasn't something that was just your right to have because you agree. I don't know if you remember back when you were 16, but you sign and agree to follow the traffic laws of that state. As a public servant, I believe it's my duty to make those roads safe for those folks who earn that right to drive on our roadways. And while we have to recognize the rights of individuals who are arrested for violations, we also have to recognize that we have a responsibility to make those roadways as safe as possible. So I applaud your commitment, your passion, and your enthusiasm, and your support for the Highway Safety Office uh, and their programs here. There is no single solution in traffic safety, no silver bullet. We have found that over the years. And the more comprehensive our programs, the more effective they are. So I wanted to leave you with a challenge to continue your efforts to bring together all safety disciplines for comprehensive solutions so that you talk and communicate with each other to find out how you fit in here and take advantage, advantage of the synergy that exists. So thank you and best wishes for a very productive conference. Thank you.